Tai labas vakaras. Pirmiausia dėka, kad atėjot ratvykot. Šiandien į profesorius kvyt paskaitą. Ir aš vėl pirmiausia norėjau padėkoti Vilniaus žydų viešiai bibliotekai už bendradarbiavimą. Ir norėjau trumpai pristatyti mūsų organizaciją. Jis turbūt nežinau, ar esat girdėjo Vokietijos istorijos instituto padalinį Vilniuje. Mes iš tikrųjų esam ganėti naujai institucijai, įsikūrėm praeitų metų gruodžio mėnesį. Ir mes priklauso Mars Weberio fondui, jisai yra finansuomas Vokietijos švietimo ir mokslo ministerijos. Ir tas fondas administruoja šešis institutus istorijos pasaulyje. Maskvoj, Romoj, Paryžiui, Londone, Vašingtone ir Lenkijoj, Varšuvoj. Ir iš tiesų tokių padalinių kūrimuose tai yra ganėtinė retas ryškinys. Padaliniai yra tik tai Kairė, Nujajam Delį ir dar keriuose šalyse. Ir dabar nuo šių metų jis įsteigė Vyrnių ir Prahoj ir mes priklausom tam institutui Varšuvoje. Tai mes esam Vokietijos istorijos institutų Varšuvoje, padalinys Vyrnių. Čia toks sudėtingas paaiškinimas. Ir visuose institucijose dirba apie 300 darbuotojų, tai daugiausia mokslai darbuotojai. Jie prada dirbti dažniausiai baigę doktorantūros mokslus. Ir institutai visame pasaulyje organizuoja paskaitas, seminarus, leidžia knygas, taip pat verčia knygas. Ir taip pat sudėkia stipendijas. Per metus yra suteikiama apie 500 stipendijų moksliams stažuotėm. Ir, pavyzdžiui, moksliams kišėtos taip pat gali gauti stažuotę atirimams svaršuvoje. Ir taip pat... Mes Vilniuje nuo Rudens pradėm jau aktyviai veikti ir mes organizuosime konferencijas, seminarus ir kiekvieną mėnesio paskutinį pirmadienį renksime paskaitų ciklą Vilniaus universitetė ir Lietuvos istorijos institutė ir jau šį pirmadienį bus paskaita Vilniaus universitetė istorijos fakultetė apie viduramžius, kadangi mūsų institutą tematika yra nuo antikos iki šių laikų, tai yra labai labai plati. Ir iš tiesų šita profesorius kvyt paskaita, jinai yra tokia papildoma ir išranginė, kuri neįtraukiam dar į paskaitų ciklo programą. Ir tai aš jūs labai visus kviečiu jau pirmadienį ateiti į mūsų paskaitą, pasakos susivokiučių kalbą ir su sinchroninių vertimų į lietuvių kalbą. Ir aš atnešiu, jeigu mums bus įdomu papildomą medžiagą apie institutą, apie paskaitų ciklo programą ir mums galite sėkti Facebook'e Vokietijos istorijos institutas. Tai turbūt tiek. Ir dabar aš norėjau pasitikti profesorį Konrad Kvyt. So, I want to present you now. In Lithuania. Profesorius Konrad Kvyt, jisai studijavo istoriją ir politikos mokslus Berlyne ir Amsterdame. 1976 metais jis persikėlė į Australiją ir tana jis tapo Vokietijos studijų fakulteto naujų į pitų Vels universiteto Sydney'e profesoriumi. 1993 metais jis jau dirbo profesoriumi Vokietijos ir Europos studijų institutė Makvario universitetė, taip pat Sydney'e. Ir šiuo metu jam yra suteiktas profesorio Emerito Vardas. Ir šiuo metu dirba Žydų muzieje Sydney'e. Ir taip pat galbūt dar reikėtų paminėti, kad profesorius Kvytis vadovavo Australijos karo nusikaltimų trimų komisijai ir jis taip pat buvo Lietuvoje komisijos skirti nacijų sovietų okupacinėms režimams narys, bet iš jos pasitraukė 2009 metais, bus gerno paklausti kodėl. Ir yra mokslo trimų sirytis, tai yra šiolaikinė žydų istorija, Pokytijos istorija, holokausto studijos ir karo nusikaltimų tyrimai. Jis yra išleidęs iš tiesų labai daug publikacijų, aš jų neminėsiu, bet reikia pasakyti, kad 1998 metais jis parašė mokslinių straipinius apie holokaustą Lietuvoje, tai iš tiesų ganėtinai anksti, anksčių tuvo ne kaip prie ir Lietuvos istorikai. Ir šiandien profesorius šią lankos su savo kolegomis, kadangi jis nuo 2015 metų dalyvauja projekte ir su to projektu jis lanko žydų masinių žudinių vietas rytų Europoje. Ir pačioj pradžioj jis lankėsi Lenkijoje, rytų Lenkijoje, Belovežo gyrioje. Taip pat per tais metais Valtarusijoje jis įsekė 322 policijos batalioną pėtsakais ir dabar jis atvyko į Lietuvą. Ir pavyzdžiui, čia gali prisai Katrina, Katrišto, iš Vokietijos istorijos nuto varšoje mūsų koleginiai keliauja kartu su profesorium kvyt, taip pat fotografija keliauja visada kartu, Aleksandra Klaik. Taip, ir jie visi kartu tyrinėja tas vietas ir taip pat vasario mėnesį pasirodė jis jų publikaciją. 
Ir, ir iš tiesų toje publikacijoje vienas iš skyrių, būtent ir bus šį profesorio kvyt paskaitą, tai mes už šiandien ją galėsim išgirsti, anksčiau negu ją perskaitį skaitytojai. So, I presented you. <laughs> so, now, uh, and now the lecture for us and the final solution. Thank you very much for this very warm welcome. I understood at least 0.1%. And uh, I also have to introduce another sponsor of that project. He is also part of it. And my friends uh, from Sydney who are joining me on this uh, excursion into the landscapes of death. How much time do we have to talk? How much do you allow? <laughs> Two hours? <laughs> An hour and a half. That long? Oh. Well, I'll leave it more for Q&A at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. The and English is fine. Otherwise, you have to switch into Dutch or into German. <laughs> I don't know how that works. Fine. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the murder of the Jews, heralded by the Germans as the endlösung, or the final solution to the Jewish question, was rooted in different spaces, times, and historical settings. Survivor historians in Poland spoke of Choban, or Choban, the Yiddish term common at the time for the destruction of European Jewry. Others referred to the Jewish catastrophe, a term used since the beginning of mass murder in summer of 1941. The word Holocaust entered discourse in the English-speaking world only in the 1950s, followed by the terms Shoah and Genocide. Today there is a consensus that the annihilation of Jews during World War II is to be regarded as the ultimate act of a genocide, an event unlike any other in history, setting, as Yehuda Bauer argues, the precedent for subsequent genocidal campaigns. The British historian Tim Coles puts, points out, and I quote, the genocide was an event that, that never stayed still, moving through landscapes. It created new places, ghettos and camps within the European landscape, or we reworked more familiar public spaces, spaces such as buildings or parks, pits or trenches, dunes or ravines, rivers or roads, and above all, forests. Forests were complex, multifaceted spaces, spaces that played a vital role, both for perpetrators and for victims. For genocidal killers, forests served as places to carry out the so-called open-air shooting, or as a French priest calls it, the Holocaust, by bullets. For Jewish fugitives escaping ghettos and camps, forests provided a temporary refuge, a limited opportunity to resist and to survive the final solution. Now, as you might have heard, since 2013, I have been engaged in a research and exhibition project together with three other historians living in Germany, Poland, and in Australia. And we are trying to depict landscapes of death, or to use a term introduced by the Austrian cultural historian Martin Pollack, contaminated landscapes. We aim to trace murder sites of the Holocaust dispersed throughout Eastern <coughs> Europe, and we are now starting to trace murder and burial sites here in Lithuania. We've started in Ponari, and there will be other sites which we're going to visit. Our work forms part of a steadily growing subfield of Holocaust scholarship dealing with the topography or the geography uh, of the German genocide. It is an approach that integrates the Holocaust into the disciplines of landscape, 
and environmental studies. We began our, and I'm using now a German term, Spurensuche, Spurensuche, searching for roots, searching for traces in autumn of 2015 in eastern Poland in the Bielewitsa Puszka or forest. It is, maybe you have been there, one of the most beautiful spots in terms of the forest landscape today, a heritage uh, worth listing and a hotspot of locking dispute. Last year we embarked on our journey to Belarus, following the route of the German police battalion 322, which in the wake of Operation Barbarossa murdered some 13,000 people, largely Jewish men, women and children and most of their Judenaktion, their actions taking the Jews took place over a stage in forests. Tonight I'm offering two narratives combining the forest with the open air shooting of that particular police battalion and in the second part I'm telling you the story of a young Jew who survived the final solution as a forest fugitive. And my narratives are illustrated by brilliant photos shot by Alexandra. She is a professional photographer. Is there anyone who knows where that pit is? Now you don't have to know, you know that you were present at that. Is there anyone with this lovely pit killing, this forest? photo is? It's not in Lithuania, it's in Latvia, in a tiny village between Riga and Ipaia. And it is a pit uh, selected to shoot gypsies, Romanies, but then at the end the mayor of that small village turned up and rescued the uh, gypsies from that killing. But it is one of the most remarkable yeah, spots within the forest for shooting and if we went to Ponari today and we saw also the open yeah, pits or trenches but this is yeah, an intriguing um, typical uh, formation for pit killing in forests. Let me set the historical scene by briefly addressing three points. I'm talking first about perpetrators operating in forest, and many of these references also apply to Lithuania. Then I'm talking about the array of Holocaust landscapes, and then on the impact of forest on the conduct and memories of perpetrators and victims. First, the murderers of the Jews were an array of different uniforms. From the ranks of the SS and police came the men serving in mobile and stationary killing units or performing their duties in ghettos and camps. The Wehrmacht became an integral part of the final solution. Some port cities, particularly up in Latvia and Greece, they played a vital role in persecution and even murdering Jews. The Air Force was often called in to uncover and kill Jewish fugitives and partisans, in particular parts of of the Belovitsa forest, but also in southern parts of Lithuania, and there the Gurys Air Force moved in and participated in the final solution. If the combined manpower of S police and the military was not available, then killers from other Nazi agencies were recruited to bolster the execution squads. Repeatedly member of the OT, the Organisation Tot, became killers, particularly in this country here and in forest areas. The forestry administration, foresters, hegers, wardens, and the so-called Forstschutzkommando played a vital role, particularly in forest areas of not only fighting against partisans, but also in fighting against um, the Jews. Indispensable for the implementation of the final solution was last but not least the vast army of local corruptors. Very quickly they took on duties as auxiliary policemen and permanent shooters or as guards of ghettos, labor and extermination camps. Furthermore, 
Familiar with the local environment, they offered their services to advancing killing units, guiding them to the most suitable murder and burial site. And last but not least, SS and policemen, soldiers and collaborators were assigned to special task force operating day and night, and also particularly here in Lithuania, the Yacht Commandos, hunt, hunt, hunting, hunting commandos, were entrusted with the task of hunting down and liquidating partisans and Jews, relishing in what they termed rabbit hunt. It was particularly here in some parts of Lithuania the case. Secondly, from the outside, the executioners of the final solution made great efforts to seek out a terrain which would facilitate a swift and uninterrupted liquidation while shielding at the same time from praying eyes. Such places had to be remote and secluded but easily accessible by road and train and Ponari is a classic example of this here for Vilnius. On the coastline there were dunes and other convenient sites shielded by bushes. I think you are familiar with this famous photo from Skeda, the place north of Lipaya, where in early winter of 1942, some 3,000 uh, Jews, largely women and children, were massacred in horrific conditions. And today, this place at this seaside has become a very impressive memorial site. Uh, you see here the Baltic Sea, then the shooting at the dunes of largely women under very horrific condition. And today on top or next to the uh, grave sites uh, is a very impressive memorial site. In the open hinterland, <coughs> There were often suitable sandy and hillshed formations marked by slopes and ravines. And this is, of course, you might have recognized this, Babi Yar at the outskirts of Kiev, where in October 1941, 33,707. One Jews were murdered. It's one of the largest uh, killing operations. Coming to Yolts is another one, Riga, certain, and then we are going also presumably to Bokanovska in the Ukraine, where you have already in autumn of 41 large scale yeah, killing operation amounting to tens of thousands of Jews. Um, in other places, so again, a photo here of Babi Yar, 33,000, and what happened after the slaughter. Yeah, that German policeman from a battalion went through and they did this everywhere, searching for Jewish belongings. And we're coming back to this. So this is the most famous ravine killing Babi Yar at the outskirts of Kiev, and also today one of the major memorial sites, which is still partly under reconstruction. In other parts, in the open hinterland, the Germans very quickly discovered something ideally for shooting Jews and others. In war crimes investigation trials, they spoke of a Kuschelgelände. Kuscheln is cuddling. It's a slowly undulated terrain where the victims were driven, like here in Novgorod and Vil. And this is a typical land formation. We can show that the next one. Yeah, these shapes. Yeah, these hill shapes where the victims were pushed through and then shot from behind. And if you think about the term which perpetrators recalled and with which they associated murder, the Kuschelgelände, something cuddly. Yeah, because it was so easy and so cuddly to shoot the Jews in this kind of landscape. It's a quite an amazing 
yeah, a linguistic uh, reference for the mindset and the recollection of murderers associating killing of people with cuddling, yeah, cushion gelände. Next one. Yeah, here again, this was in North Project, eh? I guess. Yeah. It's a park and you see here the, the, the stones of the gravesite, but also the kind of cushion gelände, undulating yeah, slope. That's a slope. Certainly, <clears throat> impressions and experiences associated with forest left a deep mark on the memories of perpetrators. In the language employed during post-war in investigations and trials, constant references were made to forests as being deep and dark, hidden and mysterious. Many remembered the sight of trees, plants and flowers. They remembered sound and smell. They were responses to climatic manifestations especially when they had to carry out their Jugendaktion in hot, humid or rainy weather, or when the arrival of the harsh Russian winter put an end to large-scale open killings. In wooden structures, in this way, yeah, that we have also in large parts of Belarusia, um, barns and sheds and huts were used to incarcerate the victims. The wooden structure was set on fire and anyone attempting to escape was gunned down. One perpetrator spent some, some time explaining to the court in Germany the lasting impact a particular flower has had on him. While shooting Jews, he perceived the smell of a yellow flower, a daisy, that was in the Ukraine. And the murder was long forgotten but whenever he saw a daisy, or when he smelled the fragrance of a daisy, so in other words, yeah, the image then re-emerged and he connected yeah, the killing of Jews with these kind of landscape climatic formation. Another perpetrator testified, and I quote from a court document, it was still summer when the action was carried out. I can clearly recall the season. We still got hold of chives, schnittlauch, and other fresh vegetables. Yeah? These are moments or images, vignettes, if you like, of memory, which are associated with murder. And they show that the perpetrator could not fully forget what he did, but ever, whenever he saw these yellow daisies, then suddenly yeah, his brain, his memory, yeah, reconnected him with murder. Finally, from the outset, the architects of the final solution showed concern for the psychological well-being of the executioners. Everywhere and from the very beginning, clear instructions were given to ensure that the killers came to no harm. At all murder sites, coveted schnapps and cigarette rations were distributed. Excursions and other forms of entertainment took place in order to, as it was said in one killing order, to wipe out the impressions of the day. Films, cabaret, Comedies and Buddha Abende, lively evenings, enjoyed particular popularity. They rapidly turned into Saufabende, drunken orgies or in sexual encounters. A festive atmosphere prevailed at open air shooting, in particular when babies were thrown in the air to be used as targets, as in trap shooting and coming back, and that happened in particular also here in this country when locals, Lithuanian shooters, participated at the beginning in this kind of sportive activities. Having set the kind of historical context, <clears throat> let me now reconstruct the journey of police battalion 322. 
And the journey started in Bielowice in eastern Poland and ended in Mogilev in western Poland. And we followed that journey. <clears throat> Police Battalion 322 was unlike the mobile Einsatzgruppen or the murder brigades of the armed SS, a police battalion. Policemen, ordinary policemen on bicycles. And they were selected to move into the rear front of areas where trucks or cars hardly could move. They were initially based in Vienna, 450 men, young men, ordinary policemen from, who have served either in Hamburg or in Vienna. And then they were prepared for deployment abroad in spring of 1941. And then they were shipped from Vienna to Warsaw. And once Operation Barbarossa started, they followed the army and moved into uh, this rear front area. And it didn't take long before they were what I call rehearsed for murder. In other words, where these ordinary men became accustomed for to kill him and became very quickly within a short period of time genocidal killers. We went into this area, the Bielowitsa forest, yeah, as I said at the beginning, one of the most beautiful forest areas. And the cyclists in cycled to Bielowice in mid-July 41. It's a very small village located in the center of the Bielowice Pusta. This was once the favorite uh, hunting ground of the Tsar, of the aristocracy, and Göring, yeah, as a master of hunting in Germany, also yeah, immediately took charge of this. It is today, as I've said, the World Heritage listing and it only took a few days to wipe out the tiny secluded Jewish communities of Bielowice and of Malarewska. At first, all Jews were, um, with, all non-Jews were resettled, moved out, and then a specific killing order was issued, which shows the chain of command, the genocidal strategy, First, men of a certain age, the age was increased, then women and children, then there's a reference to the pastoral care, and that after each, you would not see on a report has to be submitted. And this killing order we found in the Latvian State Archive in Riga, and it was used in Australia for the three war crimes trials because it was one of the very, very few specific killing orders which had, were not burned or shredded. And it shows that each Judenaktion was well conducted on an order, not coming from Hitler, but along the line of the chain of command. So the genocide was a state orchestrate yeah, uh, operation. And the defense did not challenge it. And uh, it is one of the most, I think, important document of uh, the Holocaust. Next one. Then we moved into the forest of Bielowice. We hired a local forester that they knew these places. And we also hired those who did something on the spot and were researching this area. And they showed us the first spot where the male Jews of the age of 15 to 45 were <coughs> murdered. This is a road which goes, which leads, let us to the killing field. And this is the most amazing killing field I've ever seen. Even today in Ponari, uh, this is larger and more attractive. In mid August, the Jews of Bielewice were arrested, the male Jews. They were taken into custody for one night. The women and children were still exempted, put on a lorry and sent to Cobrin, where they later fell victim to the final solution in the ghetto, because only the male Jews were shot. And here, the police battalion 
introduced the first killing technique. The killing technique which was called the sardine method. In other words, the victims were driven, you can hit the next one, into this pit and then surrounded by a wall, the marksman stood on the edge and shot or tried to target the neck and there were six layers and they were group by group moving into that pit and then after six layers the pit was filled. By then they still had some lime, chlorkyl, which was used at the beginning to prevent the chemical uh, development of uh, bodies. Here in Lithuania there are many sites where chlorkyl was anymore available and then what happened that complaints were coming from villages and then medical departments had to move in and to seal off the areas because the chemical uh, reaction of these pits yeah, caused the medical hiccup. And if you look to the landscape of this pit, it was not duck or yeah, it was not that. It was a natural formation on the top with trees. Once entry, there was no way to escape. Yeah, the Jews were driven to that spot. They had to undress themselves, driven into and then shot from above. And the report of that. The company leader was very short and brief, and I quote, the execution proceeded without event, there were no cases of resistance and no attempts to escape. Yeah. There's an order to kill, the action takes place, and a very short report, report, and if you look to this landscape, to this forestry landscape, you can, I think, guess how ideally suited this was for killing. Then, after a few days, the second community was wiped out, the one in Narevka Mala, what, some 20 kilometers. Again, the Jews were taken, arrested from their houses, brought to the churchyard, where they were again separated, men, women, and children were separated, the women and children were put on lorries and sent again away and the males were then driven to the pit. When we went to this place, our local guide got a little bit nervous because you could see people from nearby open their curtains and they knew of course that there were some strange people and they knew what has happened here. Then that in this part of the church, the Jews were humiliated. They were not only separated and beaten up, they were tortured, and the family structure was destroyed. What normally happened at the Rampe in extermination camp happened here in front of the church, and it was a most traumatic event for that. As some of you might know, family ties is the most yeah, cornerstone of Jewish history, of Jewish culture, and the destruction of family ties on that spot yeah, was already yeah, almost similar to that experience what Jews experienced when they ended up in Sobibor or in Auschwitz. From here, the males were driven on that road, passing the old Jewish cemetery, yeah, which had been restored by a school group in Israel. So they passed this way up into this spot, into the forest, and then they reached the spot at the edge of the forest where they were shot. And the company leader of police battalion 33 soon reported, I quote again, the Jews were shot smoothly and without incident. From the Bielanese forest, the policemen cited to Minsk, <coughs> leaving behind numerous murder sites and wooded and farming areas. Occasionally, Jews tried to resist after the killing of Anatoly, which is in southern Belarus, the company leader reported, and I quote, 200 
54 Jews were hiding under the hay and straw and the barns and stables, under the hay stacks and in all possible places. They could only be found and captured after lengthy search, which took up several hours of the operation. The Jews resisted yeah, because the news yeah, reached the communities and many tried to escape. Arriving in Minsk, next one, this is the old map, the police battalion joined forces with the Einsatzgruppen and with the local Schutzmannschaften. At first they sealed off the ghetto of uh, Minsk, with already some 33,000 Jews were incarcerated, and then a few days later they guarded 2,000 Jews some 10 kilometers east of Minsk into the forest of Babelovitsha. Hmm? How do you call that? Malitrovskina. It's close to Malitrovskinets, which is the, what you could call Auschwitz of Belarusia. And we followed that route. And this was one of those images of a dark, mysterious forest, because it was already in the late afternoon, raining, and suddenly we, we, we were surrounded by a forest which was yeah, quite impressive. And we walked and walked, and suddenly arrived at the, young, at the junction of two roads at a remarkable memorial site, set up by an Austrian group, what the Germans called Stolpersteine, stumbling blocks, and I think there are also a few here now in Vilnius, yeah. stumbling stones. They set here a memorial site by putting posters at the trees, yellow posters with a name, photos. Next one. Oh no, go back. Biographical data of those deported Jews from Vienna, which arrived in summer of 42 and were shot there. It's one of the most amazing memorial sites, I think, of the Holocaust. Then we move further into another spot of this remarkable deep and dense forest where no tourist has ever been. And we moved and moved and suddenly we came to a spot where we discovered something very unusual. Very unusual earth formations covered by bushes and grass. And we would, oh, that was, no, that is an early one. Yeah. Turn it around, this one. What is it? Is there anyone who knows what that is? David. It's people uh, digging for treasure in the, in the grave. Yeah, this is a work of grave robbers. Everywhere throughout Eastern Europe, even in this country and elsewhere, neighbors went to those killing fields, encouraged by the Jewish myth of Jewish money, believing that they would find coins, notes, jewelry, and starting to dig, to go into the graves and to find this. We have another one of that. Here you have a typical example of those, what young Ross and his wife have called the golden harvest. Yeah, what they did discover, particularly in Sobibor and Treblinka. Um, and other called the, the El Dorado, which indicates or which is a clear evidence that Jews were not only being robbed prior to the Holocaust, during the Holocaust, but the robbing of Jews continued long after the Holocaust and these black holes yeah, are evidence for that what neighbors, to use that lovely Polish term, uh, did here in the forest of Minsk. Okay. The next 
and final stopover of our journey was Mogilev, the regional center in eastern Belarusia, and the center which remained under military administration. So there was no political German administration. The military remained in charge due to the fact that this was closely behind the front line yeah, to the Russian or Soviet front. So the military remained here. And that didn't help or didn't prevent the SS immediately to do everything to declare Mogilev free of Jews. And already a few days after the arrival, our police battalion 322 were ordered to join forces with the Einsatzgruppen and to arrest the Jews here into that from the Judenviertel, that's a contemporary map. And the Jews were driven out from the ghetto. This is still today the picture of the old ruined ghetto. They were then driven to the outskirts of the city in North Mogilev, next one, to this place. It's a forest where they were shot, or at least part of them initially. We went to it, but we didn't go further because we suddenly discovered quite a few of land mines. We were not quite sure whether we're still working or not because that killing field at the outskirts became a Russian military training ground. So we retreated from that area and went with our guide, next one, to another lovely spot in the forest where some 2,000 Jews and the mental patient or the psychiatric patient of Mendelev were shot. It was deep in the forest and then we discovered the killing field. Surrounded by a small blue fence and marked with white uh, stones. Next one. And more than 2,000 were shot here at the end of 1941. There was no mentioning of, of Jews or mental patients were, were, as usually, Soviet citizens. But we had a Jewish guide, a renowned historian, Jakob Latin, and he marked a tree with a Jewish symbol to identify the bodies in the ground. Now this killing was quite a brutal and macabre killing at the end of this journey of the police battalion. A police officer of that police battalion wrote to his wife two days after the shooting, and I quote, I aimed calmly and shot with confidence at the women, children, and numerous babies, aware that I had two babies at home, and that these hordes would treat them the same or even ten times worse. The death we gave them was nice and quick. The babies flew in great arcs, 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 and we shot them in pieces in the air. We need to finish off the brutes who have plunged Europe into a war. This is done, yeah, not only, he has not only murdered, but was able to write to his wife the father of two children, which shows the successful, what I would call, of rehearsing for murder, the ability of ordinary men to become killers and then shooting men, women and children, even children in a way of tap shooting. It shows the, the kind of success of what I call rehearsing for murder. Ordinary men, finally, after six months yeah, were able to do that and to write to them.
The police battalion then moved to Smolensk to finish off the job. They were not any more involved in shooting Jews because the partisan warfare had taken over their campaign. But then in summer of 42, they were relieved from their heavy duty and they were sent what was called of R&R. &R. After 45, all of these policemen who had survived the war resumed their police careers, both in Austria and Germany. 20 years later, they were traced and a series of war crimes investigations and trials took place. Not one single policeman was sentenced. They were all acquitted. And what was the most amazing aspect of these war crimes trials against members of the police battalion is no one showed any remorse. They all admitted ignorance, arguing we have only followed superior orders and we only went as ordinary policemen to fight for Germany, for Führervolk und Vaterland, but we had nothing to do. It is a typical example of many perpetrators, yeah, who, went, who stood trial, but who were simply admitted. Um, they murdered with impunity. And one of, for me personally, most bitter and most shocking experience of finding of the Holocaust is that perpetrators, more or less, were not only murdered with impunity, mostly, most at least, but they were not stigmatized or traumatized mm -hmm. by that, what they did. There were a few exceptions, but most of them found it very easy yeah, to return into their normal life, to resume their duties, and when they were caught, they said there was nothing to do. While those few survivors of the Holocaust remain traumatized. Now, this is something on the finding what we also find with current genocidal campaign, uh, campaigns. Yeah, the murderer normally get away with it. The few survivors <coughs> remain traumatized. And that is, I think, the consequence of the finding what we have from the Holocaust and all other uh, genocide. So, first story, the forest the landscape for perpetrators or the forest within which those genocidal acts have been carried out. I'm now telling you the story of one survivor. This is a story of a forest fugitive. And I'm relying on the doc don't sleep. <laughs> I'm relying on a document which I found a few years ago in the Sydney Jewish Museum. It's a Durchschrift, it's an original, it's a copy of a carbon copy of um, a testimonial account recorded on the 10th of May 1945 in Bucharest. Bucharest was like Budapest or like Vienna or Munich, one center of the Chevetapata, the surviving remnants of European Jewry. And there were some 1,000 survivors of the Holocaust and largely survivors of Auschwitz and of camps yeah, east of Auschwitz, those who did not make it to Germany, to the DP camps, but those who went yeah, via Russia, who went in and turned up in Bucharest. And before they were admitted and got a bed and, and, and some food, they were compelled to write testimony, a few pages, and there are some 1,000 documents, the so-called Bucharest documents left. And these early testimonial accounts are, of course, much more important than all the later oral history project of Spielberg and the rest, because that was a time when memory was fresh. And they are totally different from later testimonial accounts, because here the temporal distance is short, they are full of aggression, they are full of bitterness. Yeah, they, they, talk, they talk about that what's happened, they're not telling about their family life 
after 45. They not couldn't tell anything about rebuilding their life and leaving it to their children and grandchildren, what all the later testimonial accounts were doing. So they are important historical sources and might be the most important one which we have. And we have altogether some 30,000 of these early testimonial accounts. Most of them starting in Lublin and Poland, but you have it in all the P camps. You have it even here in, in Lithuania when survivors were asked to recall their, their lives. Mostly written in Yiddish and others of Polish or Lithuanian. And these findings now dispute or challenge the myths that Holocaust survivors didn't speak up after 45. They spoke up at least for two, three years and then they became silent. But we found we have 29 Polish documents at the Sydney Jewish Museum and there's only one in German and this is the one. I've tried to find the originals of the documents for almost three years. I haven't found them and I don't know where they are because that becomes important when I finish my talk with a final sentence. So this is a fragment. Yeah, but my story is based on that testimonial account. Now, I call that forest fugitive Yitzhak. And I'm not now telling you why. But this is Yitzhak. It's a story of Yitzhak. And Yitzhak was born in Rodava. It's an old shtetl close to uh, the Belarusian Ukrainian border in the Lublin district and 10 kilometers north of Sobibor. He grew up in a well-established family. His father was a timber merchant and the owner of a sawmill. The products were sold up to the Poland and to uh, Germany, so he was very well off. And the father had instructed Yitzhak to learn the craft of a timber cutter. And Yitzhak learned to work hard, how to live and how to survive in forests. He spoke Polish and Russian, Yiddish and German, linguistic skills which enabled him to communicate with all people around him. He was quick at hand to utilize the natural features of forests, trees, bushes and branches, barks and leaves, grass and moss to construct shelters and hideouts. In spring, summer and autumn he found the rich and fresh nourishment the forest provided, mushroom, wild berries and honey, leafy greens and herbs, bird eggs, worms and insects, fishes and game. In the long and harsh winter he followed the laws of survival, robbing fields and barns, gardens and homes of peasants. The fight of survival required often the killing of those threatening his life. Yet despite these entire essential, what one can call, prefugative assets, so he brought with them assets which helped him to survive in the forest, at the very end, and I think it applies to all Holocaust survivors, it was sheer luck that he survived the final solution. In the first pages of his account, he recalls the horrific days and nights spent in the ghetto of Lodava, the frequent Judenaktion which extinguished his community and his family. His use, physical strength, professional skills granted him a temporary reprieve. Recruited as forced laborer, he was the, or he is deployed in nearby forced labor camps, set up at the Polish-Ukrainian border, and then he is assigned to set up the extermination camp of Sobibor. And he becomes part of these workmen who set up the camp and who are able to witness the arrival of the first victims to be guests in Sobibor. I quote from his 
testimony, that's one of the first eyewitness accounts from Sobibor, I quote, a transport of Jews from Vienna arrived. Among them was a woman. She told an SS guard that she was pregnant. She asked him not to send her to the showers. The SS men put her aside and said, if you are pregnant, you can't shower. We will take the baby out and the problem is solved. Then he took the bayonet and plunged it into her belly. She died instantly. Now, this is the language, it's the roughness, the, 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 the brutality which is enshrined in these early um, recollection, you find this not yeah, in later post-war recollection. In summer of 1942, age 18, Yitzhak succeeds in escaping from Sobibor. Returning to Vlodava, he finds his two brothers and one sisters, and they embark together on a, to a journey, what Nachama Tech, the American sociologist, has turned into the anarchy of forest, as Yitzhak put it, I quote, my itinerant of my nomadic life as a bandit began. Today there is an increasing number of studies exploring the history of Jewish resistance and in particular of the Jewish partisan warfare waged in the forest. That's also of course a very popular topic here in Lithuania and of course also some uh, political upheaval when Jewish partisan uh, were accused of being war crimes and when there were efforts yeah, to bring them to court. So it's, some, it's a topic yeah, which is as it's still a topic in, in this country, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But quite a different one. And it, I have to add, it's also the reason why I quit the Lithuanian war crimes commission. Anyway, there are only estimates available. Uh, presumably between 50 and 80,000 Jews joined the partisan movement in Eastern Europe, trying to escape into the woods and joining forces with the partisans. Nahama Tech uh, puts the number of Jews who participated in the Soviet partisan movement between 20 and 30,000. And the survival rate here is estimated to be 20%, so the chance uh, was very slim to survive even in the woods. Mm -hmm. Survivors, fugitive survivors in forest recalled the forest as alien and alienating, as unknown and scary, as threatening and unpredictable places. These descriptions were similar to those of the perpetrators, but for fugitives, forest <coughs> appeared much more sinister and frightening places, devoid of whimsy and appeal. Survivors recall the strange home of the wind and of animals, especially at night. Forest fugitives, as with inmates of ghettos and camps, lived a life on borrowed time. In the early days, escapees unprepared unable to adjust to life on the run, committed often suicide or returned to the ghetto. A returnee or someone who returned to the ghetto here in Vilnius informed Avram Turi in October of 1943 about uh, the life in forest, now not here but in Kovno, and Turi records in his diary, I quote, in the forest they entered a new world. Even people they had known earlier assumed a different appearance in the forest camp. There, one speech was different. The way one walked was different. And one thought were different. The forest veterans are wolves with combat experiences. They are not afraid of dangers. Some of them were commanders of units of fighters. Many fugitives were city dwellers, unused to outdoor life, unarmed and without military experience. As a rule, the elderly, women and children were regarded by partisans as a threat or as a burden. Often they were robbed of their meager belongings, chased away or even killed. 
Hierarchies and relationships in partisan camps were determined by gender and sexual violence. Women were frequently raped or coerced into sexual encounters. Pregnant women were expelled if they refused to abort. When women were captured by Germans and local collaborators, they faced particularly brutal violence, mutilation and murder, which was both sexually and racially motivated. Deep in the forest, in the heart of the forest, men, women and children experience in family units, those called family camps, or in partisan camps, moments of joy and pleasure, especially when sitting around campfires at night. One survivor remembered, I quote, for the first time in a year, I thought the smell of a wood-burning fire is good, and the warmth is like a paradise. I could take pleasure in such a symbol sight as the sparks flying upwards against the back, back, backdrop of the tall trees. For another survivor sitting around a campfire singing and playing accordion represented a return to a life approaching normality. The importance of fire gatherings is another sign between or link between survivor and perpetrator experiences. Fugitive died of starvation and disease or froze to death in the harsh winter. Often they were denounced and killed. Yitzhak records the encounters with hostile pe peasants and partisans and the attacks launched by the Germans and their collaborators. He recalls the end endless flights from hideout to hideout, from forest to forest, searching for food, clothing and shoes. He recalls the killing of his brother and sisters, I quote. We were hidden at the edge of a grove, preparing meals. Suddenly we heard noise and German voices, panic ensuing. We ran in all directions as the Germans opened fire. I lost sight of my younger brother and sister. I saw that my elder brother was hit by a bullet in his neck. I wanted to carry him away, but I was unable to do it. The Germans had almost reached us. He begged me to run away. I ran a few kilometers into the forest and sought refuge in the swamp. I could still hear, I could still hear the shootings. The next day, I found my dead brothers, and he also found the sisters. I quote again: After two days, I found her dead body. She was naked. Her head riddled with bullets. I fainted and fell on her body. When I woke up, my face was covered with her blood. The following day, I decided to take my own life. The revolver malfunctioned. After three days, I buried her with a shovel, I had, which I had obtained from a friendly farmer. Quote ends. <coughs> Yitzhak continues his journey on his own. Another survivor explains, I quote again, the hunger, the thirst, was awful. The cold was indescribable, but worse than anything else was the fear or the pain of being alone. Good ends. On his own, Yitzhak survived for almost one and a half years in the western part of the Pritian marshes. Again, a beautiful landscape of rivers and Swamps, a natural ground for partisan warfare because partisans could retreat and start from these places the attacks on German lines. Yeah, and it is here that he survives for one and a half years. From this area, next one, yeah. This Murodama, and this is the escape route. He moved in, 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 into this Pribian landscape. Next one, I'll hurry up a little bit. And it was an area which attracted a lot of German uh, manpower from the army because this was the so called Lasse Dreieck, the Red Triangle. Uh, and it was around the supply routes of the army from 
Poland, Brest-Litovsk, yeah, down via Minsk into uh, the Ukraine. And here with a lot of German um, uh, military station because it also became what the German called it a partisan invested area. And there were bloody campaigns between the Germans and the partisans. Next one. Yeah, here we have this area here. And he finally, yeah, this kind of stay was around this Drogovice place. I, I hurry up this one. I tried to find the unit in which he was finally admitted after one and a half years when he found the Soviet partisan unit which accepted him. I couldn't find it. But what I found is here the number of Germans killed in 44 in a German military record 131. Then once he was admitted to the Soviet partisan, he had to do something what Jews had to do in partisan units. He had to kill captured Germans. And one day they found an officer, a well-known, hated SS officer of that area, and Yitzhak was instructed to kill him. It took him three days to do that. I quote, I bound his legs and beat him repeatedly with the butt of a gun, forcing him to confess what he had done to the Jews. He justified his actions maintaining that Jews were subhumans. At the same third day I gave him raw potatoes which he ate. His pride had vanished. He spoke of his wife and his children and showed me photos of them. He now admitted that when he killed the Jews, he was only following orders. He could not answer my question as to why he did not have any compassion with the innocent women and children. He begged for mercy. I told him about the suffering and murder of my family. I finally had to execute him with a sabre. Yitzhak then describes the execution in front of the partisans and he recalls the horrific experience looking into the eyes of the decapitated head, a vision which haunted him for the rest of his life. A few months later, in July 1944, he was liberated and continued as so many Jewish partisans to fight against the Germans as a soldier of the Red Army. And his testimony concludes with a sentence on the 11th of October 1944, I was discharged from the Red Army due to my injuries. He survived, turned up in Bucharest and recorded his memories. It took me three years to find the descendants of Yitzhak in Israel. Yad Vashem and Magen David helped me and I was welcomed by the family. I entrusted the family with all my material what I assembled. His DP record his restitution records, his records giving evidence in court cases. So I had reconstructed his whole life. And the family was overwhelmed. And I was taken into that family. And then something happened on the last day, a few hours before I left Israel. He had studied all the papers, translated the German, the, the Yiddish, uh, yeah. and then he said, Conrad, I have to tell you, Yitzhak is not my father. In German, Yitzhak is nicht mein Vater. 
Thank you. So, what we do with the ending, I have then more or less finished there. Because this son, yeah, and I, I met the son and the family. They took me on board. At the end of that, he said, this is not my father, yet son. What do you make with that ending? Sorry? Did he have a family? Say that again? Did he have a family? Now, Yitzhak died five years ago, and his wife died four years ago. I met, I met the descendants, I met the sons and the daughter, the, do the, the, the family so after in he Israel. After he he married and had a family. He married also someone from the same place, as many survivors. They went then from, Buka, from Budapest into DP camps in Italy, and then in 1948 he went on Aliyah, so many DPs, and rebuilt his life in, in Tel Aviv, and became not a well-off, but moderate businessman. We went to the gravesite, I visited the grave of Yitzhak and his wife, and the son got, I think, what, half a meter of documents. And he studied it carefully, and as I've said, I was warmly welcomed by the family. And three days before I left the Holy Land, the son told me, Yitzhak is not my father. So when was that? Did you visit him after after Isaac has passed away already? No, that was what the son had studied. The son even came to my lecture and listened to it, and he saw mm. this is great. But then he studied all the documents and said he is not my father. I was shocked, uh, almost How traumatized. How many years ago have you visited him? Yeah. How many years ago? Three years ago. And Isaac passed away four years Yitzhak ago. Yitzhak died five years ago. Five years ago, yes. But is, isn't, isn't the son really, in a sense, having a difficulty reconciling the father he knew with the stories that you were now presenting him of the father that he was now having to try and accept? So I don't know. I mean, it's. I, I'm asking you, what, how what do you make out of that story? I mean, there is one possible answer, and I've discussed this with quite a few people, that the son does not want the fact that his father is killed in his SS officer, or killed Germans, mm -hmm. which is an honor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, yeah. He was fighting for his life and he killed that German, but he does not, he, I mean. But do you think it was that one, that single incident? That no, he killed probably? also others, but yeah. Jewish partisans had to kill. We have had that debate here in, in Lithuania with, with Yitzhak Agarab, yeah, and with those Jewish partisans who were accused of being war criminals by this government, because, yeah, yeah. And partisan is not, partisan warfare is a bloody, yeah, affair. And Jews often kill non-Jews, peasants, Germans, mm -hmm. yeah, Lithuanians, to survive and to, to, to fight. So these are the kind of gray zones, or this kind of, of events which, which took place. I mean, there is, I don't think that the son is clever enough to understand that, that the murder of an SS man would have made the father not eligible for German restitution. Because whenever someone asked for German restitution, they had to sign a declaration that they did not commit any criminal act. Now to kill it and to decapitate an SS officer is a criminal act. He would not have been entitled for, for, for restitution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a clause within that restitution business. I don't think that they were aware of that and I don't think it played a role. But the son simply did not want to be identified as a son of Yitzhak. I know his real name, therefore I'm, yeah, I'm somewhat duty bound not to use his name because, and I don't know whether I should finish that story. I think it's still an attractive story 
because it fits into the forest, but I'm still struggling. And the problem is, it's a documentary problem because I'm relying here on a, on a fragment from the Sydney Jewish Museum where the first parts are missing. And there is no reference to the name because they're only the last seven pages. And the first pages with the biographical data and the life story is missing in that document. The copy kept by the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw has the first pages with the biographical data. And there I find the name and this, the, the career and the veto of that guy, of, of, of Yitzhak. So I know the name, but I have to find the original. Yeah, they're all copies. And are you basing on your narrative on copies if you don't have the original? Is, is it problematic? So I have wasted three years four years traveling the world, the archives, spending a lot of money to get the originals. You have now to help me again on that. If I have the original, <coughs> and if the original has the biographical details, the true biographical details, then the son is lying. Is he the only son or the other children? No, there's an other son, but the other son doesn't want to talk. Mm -hmm. There are two sons. Mm -hmm. And a lovely, an unbelievable lovely family. What, what about the marital relationship? Could he Between the sons, we no, not no, good. Between the wife and Yitzhak. I mean, could there have been... Some yeah, I met, the great, I met the whole family. I mean, because they, they came from Vlodava, and there were quite a bit of family network and, and relatives. And you have to, it's so often that survivors of one shtetl or one, yeah, they're keeping together. And they all took me on board and I told the story and that was quite amazing. Yeah? And then at the very, very end, when I was leaving, he said, forget that legally I'm not the lawyer, but even legally I, I have to be restricted by publishing if the son says this is not my father. Because I can't actually prove it that he is lying. No, but I'm not sure. So therefore I'm using that kind of... Conrad, because perhaps huh? it's not lying. Perhaps it's just that... Psychologically, he's unable to take that on board. So it's not that he's lying, but no. he's... No. Funny, at first, there was, we have resumed contact yeah, in the last year. Yeah, so for when he told me that I was traumatized, I was paralyzed, is a better English term for that, and didn't know what to do. And then I stopped that story because I have 10 different similar stories. Yeah, because I have from that Bucharest testimony, there are 10 stories of survivors where I have the first testimonial account, Budapest 45, and then I have later testimonial accounts in war crimes or Spielberg or in books, and then I can reconstruct the life of one survivor, not only based on one testimony, but over many years, and that's important to find out the transformation and the working, the flow of their testimony. And this is quite consistent because I have his first protocol, then I have all his DP records which have been preserved, then I have all his restitution records, yeah, where he applies for compensation, why he is doing that, yeah, the family that he went into the woods. He didn't, of course, didn't say the restitution of the killed in the officer. And I was unable to identify the, the, the SS officer. I mean, there were a few documents which I skipped because I also went into the military archives to find out what's the German yeah, name of that SS officer who was killed by that guy. I wanted to bring that together, but it didn't work. And then you have that blockage so that, that he denies it. So I put that on ice. Can I ask an entirely separate, or raise a separate point? In, in those war trials that um, that um, apply to the, the 332 police battalion, I thought the Nuremberg principle um, uh, was established that following orders was no 
defence to what was clearly criminal or genocide of that. So how did, did that not impact the findings in that Italian trial? They, they, most of them, or all of them, were saying, I've, I was not shooting, I did other things. I've only heard of it, but where is the proof that I stood on the edge and shot? Okay. They've not admitted it. Then if you go for criminal prosecution, what we did in, in, in Australia, then you have to prove, and you need a living witness for that, that you, or that the alleged guy, on the 9th of October, 41, stood in Ponari and shot. If you have that witness, then you can try him for murder. If you don't have that witness, you can't try him. I mean, now in the German law, it's changed and you have the, the, the accessory to murder, yeah. and so you can punish now uh, uh, perpetrators who were stationed in Auschwitz or in, 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 in Schauen or in, who were on the spot. Yeah. And the Americans are now sending Lithuanians back to Germany, war criminals, yeah, because that's the only way now to charge them, accessory to murder. But that was not the case when you put someone on trial oh, for murder. murder. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. And Conrad, you haven't been able to ask him directly by correspondence what he meant by that. We, we're emailing again. Mm. So we exchanged greetings and I promised I'd come back and see them. But for two years I was paralyzed. And I, I, I didn't, I mean, for the historian, it's quite difficult. Eh? What do you do with, with your key witness? You have a survivor or son of a survivor who at the end of the day say, your story is marvelous, but that's not my father. What do you do? Morally, I'm not going and saying you are lying. Can you not say, you, what did you mean? What do you mean? Could you not say, what did you mean by that? What he meant? He said he's not my father. No, but you say to him, you say, you're, it's not your father. What did you mean by that statement? Well, it means that, when, that I can't give him his real name. No, but you can't ever ask him, by, not by correspondence, or by going to see him. <laughs> he said, I, he said, my, my father couldn't speak German. He, he could not have given that testimony in that faultless German. That was one argument that he used. So he's repudiating his father. If he did not he's repudiate him, if he said, that's not, not my father, father, then he did father. not repudiate him. He simply said, he, this is not my father. Therefore, he left it with this kind of... How do you call it? This kind of open ending, yeah? It allows you to speculate. Mm -hmm. And I talk to rabbis and I talk what it means for an observant Jew if your father has killed someone, yeah? And you can go into that kind of uh, fear. But he simply believes that my story on Yitzhak is not his father. And I only can prove that if I have the originals and I don't have the original first page and you are checking that again. I checked it twice in the uh, Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw and it's because the archival transmission is so fragmentary mm. and therefore one has to be very careful. Are you sure though, Conrad, that, that are you sure for yourself that that is his father? I think he is a father, he is a son. Yeah, if you look to the if you look to this to this son, then you would say he's not the father because he is a very weak boy and not a, a real timber cutter. <laughs> but that's the only photo what I got from the family. This is Yitzhak as a young boy. As a young boy, but did you have pictures of obviously you know the family? Yes. Yeah. Did they at all during your narration of the story at any point? say this doesn't fit what we know of who is our father. I would suspect he would have expressed some kind of hesitation. That happens in many stories. Yeah, because I know. And he, he, the son the did a lot of work. The son did a lot of work 
translating, yeah, because much stuff is in German. <laughs> Prostitution records are in German. The repeat <coughs> records are in German and English. So he did a lot of translation. The son and went through, it. and I left everything with that copy. Yeah, that much. Very grateful. And, and once he had studied all the material I gave him, all the family papers. So the family has all of that. He came and he waited till I left the Holy Land and told me, "Sorry, Conrad, this is not my father." As simple as that. And I always shock people when I say that at the end. May I ask something different, not about this man, but about generally about the um, definitions of genocide and the Holocaust. Now, recently they're using quite widely. Where is the, the border of genocide or Holocaust? I, I'm a very conservative historian, and I use the term Holocaust only for the murder of Jews. Only? Yeah, that's a holocaust. A genocide is a wider concept and the murder, partly open, of other groups. As far as we know, the holocaust is an ultimate act of genocide, but there are more genocides. And there is a, yeah, you can compare and contrast that. I did a little bit of genocide research, but I'm a holocaust historian. Yeah, and I focus on the history of the holocaust. I'm also more a historian of the Holocaust in terms of the history, yeah, let's say 33 to 45, and not that much with what you can, what Browning has called the aftermath of the Holocaust, so memory and memorization and all of that. So, and the genocide is, or the Holocaust is the ultimate act of genocide, but genocides continued after the Holocaust, and the Holocaust, in my view, set the precedent, precedent for subsequent genocide. The genocide from the 19th century, yeah, in the early 20th century, the Armenians, and you can even put the, the murder of, of the hunger in, 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 in the Ukraine, yeah, and you can go now to Cambodia and Uganda. These are all genocidal campaigns, 50 after the war. They're genocide. Yeah, but the Holocaust is an ultimate act because it was state orchestrated and affected the Jews. So uh, I do not mix that. During the Second World War, not not uh, I mean not any any murder of Jews, not in Spain in the mid century. No, you, these were massacres and Jewish history. Yeah, but they were not the Holocaust and not the genocide. Yeah, genocide, the term itself is a very modern one, from then came in 44. Uh, but it, it, it was born out of, by the experience of the murder of Jews in Poland, yeah? and then became part of legislation and of genocide research. Um, if you, when it comes to the use of the term Holocaust, I do not use the term to describe the murder of Romanis, the gypsies, the murder of mentally retarded or mental patient as genocide, uh, as, as Holocaust. Holocaust is a murder of Jews. Yeah, and not yeah, the murder of gypsies. And if people say this is also part of the Holocaust, I refuse that. And genocide? What is what is genocide? Genocide in accordance to the definition of Rafa Lemkin is the killing in part or totally of a religion of an ethnic group, and that could the murder. It could also mean the destruction of the cultural identity, sterilization, the removal of children, and the the killing, the killing, the murder of of an ethnic group, the destruction. And that should be always, I think, the definition of the intent. And the genocide is has become now, after the Holocaust, the hallmark of the 21st century. Because what Hitler and the, the perpetrators did showed that it's possible. You can do it. And other rulers and systems have followed that pattern, and they're doing it. In other words, after Auschwitz, after the Holocaust, the genocidal campaigns continued unabated.
what's going on. Yeah? The legal framework has changed and there are now some laws and institutions to punish that, but all, many societies continue to slaughter and to kill, to murder those groups for which there is no place in their society. Yeah, but, but not an attempt to wipe out an entire race. It's only happened once. No, but in terms of the Nazis, say, what's the intent to destroy them? And but some once people argue that's the only genocide. The others are massacres. No, but even with the, the gypsies, they, 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 the Nazis wanted to get gypsies. And that's mass murder. Other historians using the term mass violence. Yeah, or mass murder. These are and my, the, the term Holocaust is anyway not very good, it's a wrong term. It's a Greek word, it means a sacrifice by fire. There is no sacrifice by fire. Shoah is a Hebrew term and it's a destruction that's a little bit more closer. You can debate the definition, yeah, but in terms of Holocaust, for me at least, it's a murder of Jews. It's as simple as that. And if you want to include the murder of other groups, of handicapped people, disabled people, this is a mass murder of other people. Or the gypsies, homosexuals, yeah, the other victim groups, Nazi terror. Then you have, of course, other groups after uh, the Second World War with the, uh, in Cambodia and Uganda and Burundi. Genocide is a hallmark of the 20th centuries. And we it threatens us all. Yeah? And it continues. I don't think don't predict anything as a story. There's no whole cause of Jews to that point. And the question whether it will, but other groups are targeted for extermination. One more thing. Yeah. One more thing about partisans. Yeah. Some time ago you uh, resigned from the commission about That's the, correct. The, the history of uh, the trial of yeah. the partisans. And as historian, do you see the difference, and what is the difference, if there is a difference, between red partisans, doesn't matter, or maybe red Jews partisans, generally red partisans, and let's call it green partisans. Yeah, there is a difference. Yeah, what, what For Jews, partisan warfare, or joining the party, was a way of surviving. For Lithuanians joining the partisans was the aim of liberating their country. Yeah? This is behind the partisans a national aspiration of getting rid of the Germans, or the Soviets for that matter. Yeah? But it was not for them the need to survive. For Jews, the partisans was one of the very, very few possibilities of surviving. And there were partisans which rejected the Jews. And most, not even, not all Soviet partisans accepted Jews. You had to bring a gun or, yeah, you had to be a doctor and, or you had to be a welder to get. But for Jews, it was less the question of liberating Lithuania, what affects the Lithuanian partisans. It was a way of finding a way to survive and to fight against the Germans, to continue yeah, the fight. The other way of surviving was finding a Lithuanian peasant yeah, or someone in Shaolin to offer a, a place in hiding. And there were Lithuanians who did that. Not many, but they were there, the righteous Gentiles. The other way at the beginning was the escape. Yeah? to Russia or to the yeah, Hungary to free countries. So you had that response of escaping yeah, via state borders. You had then the escape in the underground, in other words, finding a place on the Aryan side. And thousands did, even in Poland, some 50,000 tried. Or the escape into suicide. And many Jews committed suicide as a way out. Yeah. So these were the responses, and so in other words, they different responses. And one response of surviving was escaping, and then from the ghettos or from the camps, and the only way to escape was then trying to, to find a place in the woods. 
and you didn't have everywhere once, yeah, in Lithuania there was certain certain ideal situation. Yeah, swamps, yeah, the Belarusian border where Jews formed uh, in family camps, in other words, when they were rejected by the general and either the national one or the, the communist one, they formed their own family units or the so-called Jewish family camps. And some 15,000 Jews, that's the estimate, survived in these family camps. They were not heroic partisans. They were poorly equipped with them. And their only aim was somewhat to survive. And they attracted those remnants or fossils yeah, from destroyed communities. But this was only possible in areas which had a topography which allowed the setting up of remote secluded family camps and where they also found some locals who helped them without any help of non-Jews, no Jews could have survived. It's as simple as that. But is, is it, just to, to understand your point, is it, do you think it's an excuse? I mean, sorry? Do you think it's an excuse? I mean, what do, you, do you think that the re two reasons to survive for Jews, partisans, and to, to uh, fight for the freedom of, of the country, for other partisans, yeah. finally they did the same thing, or, or similar things. Yeah, they killed, killed each other, killed yeah. peasants, you are right. killed soldiers. They... Is this to survive is an excuse and uh, fighting for freedom is like no, no there is one yeah. difference, I think, what yeah, I see. What is, yeah. No Lithuanian, no Latvian, no German was to a certain extent forced to fight against the Germans or the Nazis. If they accommodated, if they did what they were told to do, they survived. Jews had no choice because they were targeted for destruction. It becomes different, for example, in Lithuania or Latvia when forced labor was introduced. Yeah? And it, or even here in this country when they forced Lithuanians to join the German army yeah? to fight for the Germans. Then there's a difference because they were also held responsible for that and punished if they disobeyed them. Yeah? But for an ordinary we told Lithuanian, if someone didn't do anything, he got away with it. This gypsy is a little bit different in Eastern Europe. Those gypsies who were living a nomadic life, so the children people moving from place to place, were also killed. But who, those who had a permanent residence somewhere were not touched. But in Croatia it was different, they were all killed, the gypsies. So that changes a little bit in Europe. But for Jews, there was no other chance of staying alive by, by doing nothing. By doing nothing means arrest, deportation, killed. And the only way that was to escape, yeah, near the border, into the underground, or into the woods. Because their life was yeah, threatened. And that did, does, did not apply to what you could now call non Jewish fighters. They were convinced that they were obliged to fight for the liberty or liberation of their country. They were ruled by, yeah, by a foreign power. At the beginning, Lithuanians thought they would find a place in Hitler's Europe, but very quickly they realized that Hitler were not promising what they thought they would get national independence. Yeah, they got rid of the Soviet rule, yeah, but instead they had the Nazi rule. And they were then fighting for what you could call um, for national liberation <coughs> and the national resistance movement in Latvia and and this way it became quite strong, 43, 44. And then for Jewish communists, it's different. I mean, they were communists and less Jews, but they also rekindled then the kind of Jewish 
identity because they were not only treated as, as Protestants but also as Jews. It was a double jeopardy. I wanted to ask about the images, that the pictures that you made. I mean, when you see these pictures, I remember also very often the testimonies of survivors when they came to Ponary and they come out of the forest and tell that they find this transformed landscape that's now beautiful, they hear the birds, they see the sun. And I wanted to ask you how you are going to include these pictures in the book while we will be telling these uh, terrible stories of the mass atrocities and you have this beautiful aesthetic, this unwanted beauty images how you deal with it? The question for you. You are shooting these images. I don't have a real answer. I think we have always to live with this gap. I mean, the, the, this is what's there, you know. This is when you are going there now, when you see this landscape. And, I don't, and a lot of space to not even see something. There's no memorial site, there's nothing you can go into it. And then you have only this landscape, and it's green, it's beautiful. And then you have the stories, and I think you have to put everything on your fault, and you have to bring it together, but you have to do it again, and you can't, you can't go over it. And there's, I think there's no possibility to, to get over it. So. We're trying to design in the next couple of years an exhibition on, on these landscapes. And I'm personally more attracted by forests, but as you see, there are other landscapes too. And what this kind of new approach shows that, that we are not telling any more or only the story of, of the perpetrators, what they did and how they did it, or the memories of the survivors, when, but we are trying to show the environment, the landscape within these actions or these behaviors uh, unfolded. And I think it, it's a new dimension of understanding yeah, history. And there will be not many historical texts, but there will be some historical quotes from documents, yeah, or killing orders, reports, and there will be some testimonial accounts how survivors, yeah, perceived, yeah, or recalled the forest. So Exhibitions should not have much historical text. They're boring. Yeah? The less historical text you have for an exhibition, the better it is. The more visual yeah, images you have and the more authentic historical documentary texts you have in terms of quotes. So if I have a diary of, a, of, a, of the police battalion or a killing order or a short testimonial account of a survivor, this is, fits more into that kind of then today, I mean, no one is interested anymore in museum to read historical texts, boring, or to read books. There are other forms of of displaying, of narrating, yeah, those things and visual images, landscape. I think not this one, the first one. Can you go back to the first one? Yeah, this is yeah almost symptomatic for the forest. Well, Conrad, another. If I just make an observation, though, I, I think we are. This is my this is my take on it. I'm. I think we are superimposing the the the, the current beauty on something that wasn't chosen for its beauty. It was chosen at a much more pragmatic uh, level. It was remote. It was accessible, as you said, and it had ravines or dips so that actually the bodies could naturally fall. And the pictures that are shown of the actual pits, you know, Babi Yawa, the bodies, the, the pits at uh, Panari, there's nothing uh, aesthetic about that. It's absolutely... Not in the photos, but it is... I, I mean, I don't know how much I'm obsessed by it, but uh, I always ask myself, how beautiful was the landscape in which murder took place? I mean, if you go to Lanzmann's story of, of the camps, yeah, the river, the music, this is amazing. And the, the perpetrators perceived that, 
Yeah. And victims, yeah, also were taken, and particularly if you reconstruct the last marches of victims, let's say from Mala Marevska to the pit, this was a familiar path they went. And what it meant for them when they arrived in groups and when their predecessors were shot, you, they heard that. Yeah, it was, it took out for hours. And the neighbors, or the, the villagers heard these salvos of shooting. Now, you don't find that normally in the, in the history books, yeah? but, but once you are there at the spot, and once you even hear the Soviet, or the, the Swedish army is uh, testing guns, yeah. you, get an, you, you feel something what you normally don't have if you read, or if you research something, and what I find so amazing with this bloody tour, what we're doing, here I'm doing something, yeah, and I'm okay. quite blunt on that, what I've done over years in archives, in writing an article, in giving lectures, now I'm going to the spots, yeah. and see what, yeah, the landscape, and see the site in Punari, and I did a lot on Punari, and, and on the other side of this way, yeah, now I'm there. I'm not like in the 18th century, Goethe and others went to Italy to get that kind of yeah, uh, cultural uh, image, but it is something what I experienced at the end of my career, what I've done over years in yeah. archives, reading books, reading documents, um, suddenly I'm there where it took place. And this is something. Yeah. But you know, today Rosa told us that when she went there, eight years after the end of the war, it was very degraded. Yeah. So it, there was the ash. Exactly, there, and there this, I the found that very intriguing today. Yeah? I have to record that in one way. Yeah? Normally the story finishes in 45. Mm -hmm. but then you have the aftermath studies and the, you know the grave robbers and what they did. And then you see that it took years. Yeah? And then things happen in those killing fields which are quite remarkable and you don't find that a lot in literature. They either have the history of the Holocaust or the history of the Swainian Holocaust, but that 45 is finished. Yeah. But no one is listening to historians anyway. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I add something? Can I add something? Uh, and because of this beautiful landscape, I think it's not only to take pictures of beautiful landscapes, I think there's much more. There's something where you can go there and you can actually see what happened. You can, you know, you, know, you can capture what, what happened and how they killed and where they come from and you can all see this and you can see what happened after this, how people treated this kind of places, how they, where they put stones, how they, if they go to the mass graves and if they put it something around or is it still only landscape and I think this is about taking these pictures too, you know, you can s to see things like this and to, to understand something about how, what happened and how we act on these places. We yeah, have many uh, witnesses that came to say that this is the forest is a very unstable witness mm -hmm. because it changes mm -hmm. and it does not leave. Like the yeah. trees, they change and everything changes. Yeah. And it's very, very unstable, but yeah. stays. We have uh, our institute in, in Warsaw celebrates this year 25 years anniversary and they have bags, presents for you and for the team? For, for the library. <laughs> oh, <I'm sorry. laughs> so. Uh, this that. is for you. Oh, lovely. <laughs> and this is for I don't see This is for you. <laughs>